and welcome to the Rediscovering Play podcast brought to you by Biba. I'm your host, Mike Rosen. As we've previously discussed, our mission at Biba and the goal of this podcast is to investigate, explore, and question what it means to play for kids in this modern era. Whether that's through building mobile games designed to get kids back out on playgrounds to get the physical activity that they need, or doing a deep dive into parenting tips in this new technological age, we are committed to rediscovering the idea of play for today's families. And what better time to be rediscovering play? While many of us are finding ourselves spending way more time inside and working from home these days, it's understandable that we might be trying to figure out how best to maintain a sense of normalcy and how to avoid going completely stir-crazy while cooped up indoors. This is especially true for parents who are dealing with the fact that their children are home, schools are closed, playdates and activities are limited, and on top of that, kids have questions about what's going on in the world and parents need to know how best to answer them appropriately. How do we maintain a sense of play in these trying times? How do we play with our children in a way that's both fun and safe? How do we maximize the limits of our confined spaces to make sure that our kids are still able to get the physical activity that they need? On this next series of episodes of Biba's Rediscovering Play podcast, we aim to answer these questions and more through conversations with parents, childcare workers, medical staff, and various other industry professionals to provide you with helpful tips and tricks, new perspectives, and fresh insights to help ensure that you and your family can stay happy, healthy, and active while we navigate this new current at-home situation. Join us while we rediscover play together. On today's episode of Biba's Rediscovering Play podcast, our guest is Natasha McBeardy. Natasha McBeardy is a registered psychotherapist with over 15 years of experience working in community mental health care and private practice. Natasha holds an MA in counseling psychology from McGill University and has extensive postgraduate training in a number of therapeutic approaches, including play therapy, narrative therapy, cognitive behavioral therapies, the neurosequential model of therapeutics, and mindfulness-based approaches. Natasha is also a mother of three and the current Associate Executive Director at Crossroads Children Mental Health Centre in Ottawa, Ontario. Check them out at crossroadschildren.ca. Natasha speaks to us today about signs that your children may be struggling with anxiety and mental health issues around COVID-19 and the things that you can do to help address those challenges and help support them through these times. There's a lot of practical, good, useful tips, so I hope you find it really interesting and I hope you enjoy the conversation. Here's Natasha. Hey, Natasha, how's it going? Good, I'm good. Thank you. How are you? Doing well, all things considered. It's, um, it, it's an interesting time. I mean, we've been, we've been in this sort of, you know, quarantining, shelter-at-home situation for a while now. At least in BC, we're hearing a lot of conversations about people going back or, or, or shifting back and, re- and reducing some of these restrictions. So uh, it's, it's, it's bringing up a lot of different questions, I think, for myself and for everyone else that I've been speaking to also. So um, a lot of questions about how things are going to go, but I, uh, all things considered doing well. How are you doing? Yeah, same. I think you summed it up well. It's just, you know, so many questions, a lot of waiting to see how this is all going to unfold and uh, a lot of waiting and seeing, right? Doing the best that we can in the moment. Yeah, and it sort of it sort of ties into to one of the main things that I wanted to chat with you about today is, you know, as as things have progressed and and you know we're we're a few months into this now and who knows how long it's going to continue, um, behaviors and people's relationships and thoughts around a lot of what's going on are are changing in a lot of different ways and people's anxieties as adults and parents are sort of fluctuating up and down. But I think that's that's very much also true for children. Um, and one of the interesting things that I've seen you talking about online is is the fact that the, the these anxieties that children might be experiencing are are manifesting in different ways because they may not necessarily have the tools to um, articulate what it is they're feeling. Is that something that you're running into? Is that 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 you're hearing from parents that their children are feeling anxious and and their behavioral patterns are changing? Yeah, absolutely. I think you summed it up really nicely that you know all of us are on this kind of roller coaster ride you know we have good days we have bad days um days that are easier days that are a bit harder and i think children are the same um and and what we tend to see with children especially in younger children but also in in youth uh, is that they don't always have the words to tell us what's going on and so what we end up seeing is a lot of behaviors and uh, even with really, really young children, I mean, they may not be talking about it, they may not fully grasp the situation, but they really co-regulate 
um, based on the adults around them. So, you know, I think we can assume that they're absorbing information and stress from adults, even if they can't really verbalize um, exactly what's going on or what some of the anxieties are related to. Yeah, I feel like that, that anxious energy is very, very contagious and it's something that's that's palpable. And, you know, when when there's so many questions about, you know, fear about the coronavirus and, 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 and a lack of understanding as to how how we're supposed to be behaving and how that behaviors are, how those behaviors are going to change and what's going to happen over time is, is creating, you know, uh, uh, an understandable amount of anxiety in adults and, you know, even children, like you said, of, of young ages that you might not necessarily be able to talk to about it, or you might not be having the most in-depth conversations about what's going on. Like they have to be feeling that also, right? Yeah, definitely. I think, yeah, absolutely. It's safe to assume that they're, you know, stress hormones and, you know, all of that is at play. And it's really interesting. I had, you know, even with my own children, um, you know, they're pretty young and uh, they were playing this game with little figures and, you know, just listening to, you know, them playing together, the themes are about, you know, the end of the world and ambulances and saving lives. And so I just found it really interesting that even though we're not necessarily outwardly really having these conversations, you know, they're not watching the news, but they have this sense that something really big is at play. And so I think, you know, play gives us a really good indication into like what's kind of in their psyche, what, what kind of issues they're grappling with, which is so interesting. Yeah, that's one of the things I find so fascinating. And one of the one of the past episodes in this podcast, I was having a conversation um, about the way that play is being impacted by um, the coronavirus and, and, and the way that kids are sort of are trying to understand through play quite often and whether it's, you know, role playing and that like, oh, we're playing doctor and I'm diagnosing your test for, you know, whether or not you have COVID or those sorts of things. Yeah. Or like you said, playing about these sort of end of days world scenarios, I think is such a fascinating response that children have to to these these questions that they may have to try and work through it in that way. Oh, it is really fascinating. I mean, I think, you know, I kind of bring a trauma lens uh, oftentimes to the work that I do. And, you know, um, I really like Bruce Perry's work and he talks about, you know, regulating, relating and reasoning. Um, and, and when you think about kids play, like it's often organized around those themes. Like when you think about regulating your emotions, it's like the kind of rhythmic activities, physical activities, swinging, you know, rhymes, uh, rhythmic music and whatnot. And then there's those relational activities, like your kid just being like, help me, watch me, wonder in me, um, you know, delight in what I'm doing. And then the reason, right? It's like, help me make sense of this, help me build skills, help me understand what's going on. And I think that, you know, the play looks really different in each of those buckets. And it's fascinating to watch children move through those buckets, depending on what state they're in. Mm -hmm. And I guess it also, I mean, in an ideal scenario, you know, parents would have all of the cycles and all the all the free time that they need to be able to be engaged and active and paying attention to their children during these times. But I think with everybody cooped up at home and, you know, trying to figure out homeschooling, depending on how old the children are and, you know, trying to trying to work from home and all those sorts of things, I'm sure that um, parents own maybe tolerance, but maybe just time and, 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 and ability to be able to pay attention to what their children are doing when they're asking them to watch them or when they're playing and, you know, the, the, the types of themes that are coming up in their imaginative play. Um, parents may not necessarily have the, the, the time or the resources to really be engaged in them to fully understand what, what their children are, are trying to process. Yeah, that's such a good point. I've been thinking about that so much, actually, in my own life, as you know, we're all kind of in this together. And I think that, you know, we talk a lot about kids doing the best they can. And that often like these kind of challenging behaviors that we see are really like, an indication of something deeper that's going on or a lagging skill or whatnot. But I think it's so important to remember that parents are also doing the best they can, right? Like it's easy to say, stay calm and, you know, establish routines and play with your kids and all this, you know, ideal stuff. But really play requires us to be emotionally available. And I think for a lot of parents right now, their emotional bandwidth is, you know, really taxed by all the different demands that that they're facing um, based on the situation. So, you know, in my own life, I've been thinking a lot about, you know, intentionality um, and about spontaneity, because I think that, you know, 
we are in this weird period where on the one hand, a lot of us have, you know, a lot more time in a way. Um, I don't know if it's more time, but less structured time, I guess I would say. Um, but on the other hand, you know, we have all these competing demands without the clear boundaries of like, I'm going to work right now and now I'm here to play with you and now we're going to piano lessons or whatever that looks like for, for your family. So I think it's, you know, how do we make ourselves emotionally available um, throughout the day? It's almost like catching moments, right? Where that spontaneous play can emerge and, and where we can really connect with our kids. Um, and that's not easy. I've, I've been grappling with it myself and really trying to remind myself of that intention. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, what I'm starting to see, at least anecdotally, is that a lot of parents are seemingly, because of the length of time that this has gone on and recognizing sort of how impossible maintaining some of those expectations of, of being sort of perfect in all those different categories, whether it's yeah. work or parenting or homeschooling or whatever it is, and, and how impossible it is to do all those things at the same time. And what I'm seeing is that, you know, a lot of parents are kind of recognizing, like, we're going to try our best. And if we aren't able to do it, then we're going to pivot in whatever capacity. I just saw this great post um, a friend of mine posted on Facebook, and it was about how, you know, we had the best intentions of learning math this morning, but it very quickly changed to my daughter sort of, you know, directing what, what learning was going to look like today. And this is the result of it. It was a video of the two of them, and they were like replicating one of these dances that they saw on TikTok or on YouTube <laughs> or whatever it was. And she's like, you know, we That's tried our great. best, but we ended up having this engaging moment together. And I wasn't trying to change the behavior. We're sort of just saying, like, this kind of is a challenge and in many ways sucks for everybody. But if we, if we listen to each other and we try to get out in, 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 you know, in an engaged, fun way where we enjoyed ourselves and we were present in the moment together, then there are, wor there are worse things we could have done than, than learn a dance together today. Oh, a hundred percent. Actually, you know, I don't want to knock school. Of course, school is super important, but I think there's all this pressure on parents to homeschool and really, it's, you know, learning it happens everywhere it happens through play it happens through those dance moves it happens through relationship so we think you know that acceptance and that not judgment like not getting hung up on how things should be but you know taking advantage exactly as you're saying of those moments that present themselves those opportunities because at the end of the day the best buffer against stress and the key to resilience is relationship and so sometimes putting school aside or you know it's okay like you're you're making a choice to to really connect with your child and and offer that support and and nurturing care that's going to help them you know cope with with what they may be feeling mm -hmm. and that's why like i i really like what you were saying there because it reminds me that like or or makes me hopeful that um you know one of the silver linings one of the positive things that can come from this is is, is a recognition of how important play is because like we've talked about already you know it's it's a great sort of reliever of of stress and a great way to sort of manifest um, and, and explore these anxieties that people might be feeling it's also moments for engagement between parent and child and there's also a ton of learning that occurs through that whole process so in, in some ways it sort of ticks some of the main boxes of learning being engaged having fun being active distracting yourself from all this stuff and also pr processing what's going on um, play seems to be the solution in many ways for a lot of what a lot of people are feeling I can't agree with you more. I think, you know, again, as I've been thinking about this play and mindfulness and presence, like they're so all interrelated. Um, and, you know, back to your point about parents and all the different demands, like I think it's also forcing us as parents to rediscover play, you know. Um, some people are still working, others are finding themselves, you know, laid off and, and having, you know, more time than they know what to do with. And so rediscovering um, just what that feels like to play or to find things that you're engaged in um, is so important, right? If we're connected with play, then then it's easier for us to support our kids to connect and play. Mm -hmm. So I want to pivot the conversation a little bit because obviously like we were talking about different different anxiety responses that children might be having. And, and I think that the, the most sort of benign, healthy, healthiest one is sort of like, hey, they're changing the way that they're playing. But I think that there's probably also some some not so positive or some, some more seemingly negative behaviors that children also have in response to these anxieties, right? Yeah, I mean, there's a whole range of things. Um, you know, it can be anything from, you know, just 
frustration, right? However, that comes out, um, uh, you know, kids reverting back to behaviors that we thought they had grown out. So, you know, if you've celebrated that their, your kid is now sleeping on their own, they may have crawled back into bed with you and are refusing to sleep on their own. Um, it could be, you know, feeling more irritable and like touchy. So, you know, sometimes it's like you feel like you're walking on eggshells. So, I mean, there's really such a range of, of behaviors. Um, and I, I really like, I, I was, you know, I heard this mom say, you know, I'm, instead of giving consequences, I'm giving hugs. And, you know, she was making the point that, you know, underneath all of these behaviors, there's a little kid trying to tell you what's going on. And, you know, it's not necessarily that they, you know, think that behavior is okay and need a consequence to reinforce that that's okay or not okay. But it's really that, you know, they're reaching out in the best way they know how. And that's tough. That's tough for parents who, you know, dealing with an irritated kid is not fun. And so, you know, again, that emotional availability and presence and intentionality. Um, yeah, really taking the time to empathize with where kids are going, what they're going through at a time where, you know, we also need to bring that empathy to ourselves because we're also going through a lot. Yeah, I think that's a really good point because it's, it's, you know, as, as challenging and as frustrating as it might be for parents when children are sort of behaviorally not acting the way that you're, you're hoping, recognizing that they're not doing it just because they want to be difficult. They're doing it because they're having a hard time processing something or they need, they need attention or because they are scared and they don't know how to tell you that because they're still trying to grapple with what that emotion means and what those feelings they're having are and, and recognizing that they're not just trying to make your life difficult. They're trying to sort of process what's going on and recognizing that intention, hopefully, will hopefully make make those those moments a little less irritating and and will foster more sort of patience and understanding and, and more empathy and compassion in those moments as opposed to like, you know, an antagonistic view of, of what those behaviors might be. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, you know, and I think a lot of us have those, you know, remnant kind of views of, you know, it's manipulative, or they're just trying to get what they want, or, you know, which, you know, whatever, there's no judgment, but I think it's, you know, exactly to the point you're making is, um, you know, it's, it's their best way of them coping with a difficult situation. It's the, you know, how they know that with the skills that they have, um, they're trying to, to signal something. And so, rather than focusing on the behavior, and whether or not, you know, we want to consequence that, or, you know, it's really how can we try to understand what's happening underneath that behavior and address and problem solve that particular problem, starting with empathy and then moving into to helping them generate some solutions that are maybe um, less irritable for everyone. Mm -hmm. So obviously every child in every situation is different, but do you have sort of any any high level suggestions or or tips or things that, that parents can do if they're starting to notice, you know, increased anxieties amongst their children manifesting in one of the many ways that we've sort of discussed? Yeah, well, I think, you know, you brought up the play as the solution to everything. And just to build on that a little bit, like, I think at this time, as I mentioned, like relationships are really um, the key to resilience, like really, you know, most impactful in helping kids cope with stress. And so if if we can, you know, ourselves um, stay calm, and I know that's not always easy depending on what's going on, but that goes a long way. Um, I think that, you know, again, looking at some of the nonverbal signs that kids are distressed. So, you know, just being aware that it's not going to come out in uh, words necessarily, but you may start to notice some of the things that we talked about, and then kind of taking their lead. So how can you, you know, be the container to receive all of those emotions, whether they're positive or negative, and making it okay for our kids to come to us and, and to kind of unload some of that stuff. That doesn't mean that, you know, we need to be punching bags, but just acknowledging that there's some pretty difficult feelings um, that they're experiencing, that maybe some of those feelings are at odds with each other, maybe they don't quite make sense, but just helping them to kind of sort that out. And, you know, play is a great way to do that because we have an opportunity to you know, follow their lead to, you know, if they're trying to work something through to just kind of be alongside them. And without, you know, redirecting, just accepting and validating and acknowledging what they're sort of bringing to the table in terms of, of feeling or, or, you know, 
you mentioned, you know, the, the, the kind of themes that, that kind of come up through play. And, and so I think that's really a way of showing uh, deep empathy and validating feelings, um, you know, through play, just, just following their lead. I imagine that obviously depends on the age of the children as well, but even just having like an, if, if they're sort of on the, on the older side of, of, of things, or I guess even if they are younger, you could figure out how to, how to have that conversation in a way that's age appropriate, but talking to them about your own fears and anxieties and questions about what's going on and not in a way that's going to scare them, but sort of just as an, as an open conversation to let them know that like these feelings that you're experiencing are, are normal and are okay. And we can talk about these things and, and, and be open and, um, share those those feelings that we might be having together um, would probably engender more closeness as well obviously without without fear mongering right yeah yeah i i definitely think you know normalizing those emotions that it's not just you you know sometimes mom mommy feels scared too like those kinds of things are really helpful um i think what we want to do is reassure them that as adults we we are doing things to keep them safe and so it's you know really empowering them with what they can do especially you know when we're talking about the covid situation so all the things they can do like wash their hands and physical distance and maybe you know arts and crafts like the rainbows in the window to encourage help. you know like there's all those things that they can feel like they're having they're participating and they're 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 empowered to to be mem you know members and contributing members of society um but at the same time emphasizing all the different things that adults um not just mom and dad but in general are doing to keep people safe because i think it's really important for kids to see us as that stable force or that that comforting presence that they can go back to Right. So I guess it's sort of like recontextualizing those anxieties or those unknowns as opposed to focusing on the things you don't know about them, focusing on the things that you do know about them and turning those into those empowering actions. Like you said, you know, we can we can wash our hands, we can do these things, we can keep ourselves and we can keep everyone else safe and we can do all this, this sort of stuff that are action oriented things that are sort of, you know, you're not just just looming in this circle of, of unknown, you're you're sort of turning those things into positive actions that you can take to hopefully alleviate some of those those anxieties exactly yeah it's so it's so fascinating i mean i've talked about this quite a bit on 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 this sort of podcast series and i feel like it's coming up quite a bit and maybe partially due to the fact that i find i'm a bit of an eternal optimist but i think that it seems like a lot of the solutions to a lot of these things in terms of mental health and 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 happiness and, and healthiness within within a family comes from you know, being present and really taking the time to pay attention to each other and to, to, to share in these moments together. And, you know, obviously that becomes a lot easier because everybody's sort of stuck at home now. But I think one of the things that I'm hoping happens is that when we come out of this back into, you know, more of a quote unquote normal situation is that parents and, and families recognize that, you know, maybe we've been overburdened in terms of scheduling everything and, and having too many activities. And maybe it is nice to be able to have dinner together as a family every single day. And, you know, maybe, maybe it is, um, you know, a, a nice treat to be able to say like, we, we didn't, we were in this routine where everybody was running around constantly. And, you know, there's, there's some solace in that maybe, but at the same time, like getting through these tough times, comes from you know being engaged and being present and, and showing love and showing compassion and I, I hope that that becomes a bigger priority for every family going forward as we come out of the side of this as well. Yeah I'm right there with you I think about that a lot because I think that a lot of the peripheral stuff has just been kind of paused right it's like we have this opportunity to reset and you know we're not out buying stuff every day and we're not out you know running from lesson to lesson and time is a lot less structured which gives us a lot of flexibility into you know in terms of how we reorganize it to meet our family's needs I think you know on the one hand that's um a bit overwhelming in some ways I mean speaking from my own experience you know when I am trying to organize you know some time with kids and some times at work and some time exercise, you know, all those things you're trying to fit in. And all of a sudden it's like everything, all your anchors have all of a sudden disappeared. And now it's up to you to figure out what that sort of magic formula is in terms of setting that routine. 
And then there are days where it works and it's just beautiful and it's, you know, it's exciting because, you know, to your point, like there's this optimism about, well, maybe we could keep this up, you know, beyond the pandemic and really how do we hold on to these nuggets that are really working for us well now and bring them forward uh, and not just get back into the grind and the rush of, of everything when we go back. Um, and, you know, and then on the other hand, there's some days where it kind of all just falls apart. And then, you know, we've got to kind of reset and, and pick up the pieces and start again the next day. So I think it's, you know, we started this conversation talking about the roller coaster. And, you know, maybe I'm just sort of reemphasizing that. But I think that's okay. And, and we really have to bring a lot of compassion to ourselves and to our kids. Um, and just know that all of us, again, are doing the best that we can to deal with a, a really difficult and strange situation that none of us have any anchor for in terms of navigation. Mm -hmm. And I guess the other thing like we were sort of talking about at the beginning is, you know, I think that when this whole sheltered home thing started, I think that was obviously a huge adjustment for a lot of people. And there are a lot of questions about what that meant and what those changes were gonna be. And then as we've been in it for a little bit longer, people have been adjusting and, and sort of coming coming to face with with a bunch of different new challenges that are that that have come about from from being at home with everybody but i think that you know as 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 different provinces and different states and different cities are talking about potentially reopening what what do you think we should be doing to to help our children from a mental health perspective prepare for going back to normal because i would imagine that just like a shift back to being outside and going back to all those other routines is probably not going to be a good healthy thing either yeah, and you know, that's really, really important point, because we also know that kids deal with transition in different ways. So, you know, like adults, some of us are really good with change, and some other of us kind of dig our heels in and, and don't really like change so much. So I think it's, it's going to be about preparing our children for that transition back, right. And so I kind of think of it like a very extended summer holiday where, you know, you're going to be thinking about how do we get those routines back aligned with school routines? How do we prepare our children for, um, you know, whether that's school or maybe I'm being optimistic, but camp or, you know, whatever that looks like. And just sort of starting to, to put pieces in place to, to immerse them back into some of those routines. Um, and then I think we'll have some and we'll have to have some conversations because we don't know what that'll look like in terms of, you know, what those school structures look like in terms of physical distancing and all of those pieces. So I think they'll, you know, we'll need lots of education pieces. Um, that are developmentally appropriate and and you know tailored to to where kids are at to to kind of equip them to to deal with uh, that that slow recovery back into I guess our new normal. Right, and I guess sort of similar to the the advice that you had before is that the most important thing is to sort of let your kids take the lead in many ways and sort of watch what their behaviors are and 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 tailor what you're doing to what they need, obviously, and 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 listen to them and and you know try to try to try to address their concerns and their fears and their anxieties in a way that's most appropriate for them and listen to the things that they are worried about and that they aren't necessarily worried about and, and just sort of manage that transition from there. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think that's kind of at the root of it is really making space for your child to to share their concerns, you know, whether that's through play, whether that's through conversation, uh, whatever that looks like. And then, you know, together really engaging them and generating solutions. I think that, you know, often we kind of come at our children with solutions because we know best, we have life experience, but um, there's so much value in, in just kind of pausing and, you know, empathizing with, you know, some of the feelings they're bringing up, but then also really trying to get curious about what the concerns they're bringing to the table are, because sometimes we jump to conclusions and we think, oh yeah, you're concerned about going to school because, you know, I don't know, homework, when really the concern is maybe about you know, the walk to school and, and who's going to walk with me, you know, like, I know that's a really simple example, but, you know, sometimes we, we don't always, unless we really linger in hearing what that concern is, we may be throwing solutions uh, on it that don't really uh, address, address the problem. Right. Recognizing how much we can learn from our children at these times also, as opposed to us being the experts, especially when we're in sort of this untrodden territory that none of us had been in before. And, you know, we all might think we have the answers, but I think the only way we're going to truly find the answers is by doing that together, both from a macro level and from a more micro familial level. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We have so much to learn from kids. <laughs> 
<laughs> Absolutely. They are, you know, they're real experts in their own situations. And they also have so much wisdom, you know, like they are able to, to play and to, to work things out through play. And, you know, I think I'll, well, I'll speak for myself, but, you know, we have like a lot of that work ethic and, you know, it, it's harder for me to, to just kind of let go and be present and, and be spontaneous than my kids who can just run outside and kind of let all of that disappear um, and really play freely. So, um, yeah, I think we do. We really have a lot to learn from from kids in terms of how we manage our own stress. Yeah, and I really like what you were saying before about how hopefully this is an opportunity for for parents and for adults to rediscover play themselves. Because like you said, I mean, that, that freedom and that spontaneity that children have that we tend to either learn or tend to, you know, throttle as we get older, I think is... is is a shame because I think it's such a beautiful skill. And I think the more we as adults can, can take those sort of behaviors and those abilities back, um, I think we'd benefit all of us greatly. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I want to say that with a grain of salt, because I know that there are some moments where my kids want to sit down on the floor and play with their little like figures that I just, you know, there's not that I'd rather be anywhere else than there. I'm going to be honest. <laughs> um, you know, sometimes kids' needs in play are different than my own needs and what they find fun isn't necessarily what I would call fun. And so, you know, there's that too of giving ourselves permission that, you know, engaging, making an intention to, to you know, join with our kids in play doesn't always mean that we're going to find this the funnest thing in the world. Like maybe I don't feel like playing Simon Says, but what our children are getting out of it is so valuable. And then if you let yourself go, you might just enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> but not always. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think this is, you know, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I think there's a lot of really interesting things that we've talked about. And again, I think that the, the sort of macro takeaways that I get from this is, you know, these, these behavioral responses that we have ourselves and that our children have are going to be changing over time. And the key is to sort of just like listen in and recognize intentionality. I know that's something that's come up quite a bit um, in this conversation, but, but understanding you know, where these feelings and where these behaviors are coming from and asking those questions and being sort of patient and, and, and understanding of where those things are coming from um, is the key to understanding sort of, you know, how, how to get through them, but also how to, to, to be a, a little bit more compassionate about, about why, you know, behaviors might be acting out or whatever it might be um, to, to, you know, come up with healthy solutions to make sure that everybody emerges from this thing happy and healthy and, and stronger as a familial unit, which is really all we can hope for. Yeah, I think all of that makes good sense. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today, Natasha. I really, really appreciate it. And uh, I hope that you and your family continue to be well. Well, thanks so much for the conversation. I really enjoyed it. Thanks so much. Thanks. Bye. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's conversation with our guest, Natasha McBeardy. If you want to check out any of the other episodes in Biba's Rediscovering Play podcast or anything else as part of our Parenting During COVID-19 Crisis series, check us out at rediscoveringplay.fm or on any major podcasting platforms. As always, we really appreciate you taking the time to listen to today's episode. Hope you found it interesting and that you enjoyed it feel free to share it with your friends. Thanks so much for rediscovering play with us.